Last time on Dragon Ball Z, despite Gohan's best efforts, Majin Buu was reawakened. And unfortunately for everyone in attendance, he was in the mood to play. Deborah, none too impressed by the carefree attitude and rotund appearance of the Apocalypse Bringer, was the first to challenge, making sure Boo knew in no uncertain terms that the King of Hell thought he was softer than his bubblegum adjacent appearance even led on to. The Majin Menace did not take kindly to the challenge, forcing Deborah to don his finest Ray Charles cosplay before sending him headfirst into the third string villain leagues. Goku, sensing the overwhelming display of power, put a brief stop to a squabble with Vegeta in hopes of helping the possessed prince realize that the situation changed and there was more at stake right now than their Saiyan pride. After ingesting a few more knuckle sandwiches and shots of the truth, the prince finally got on board and agreed with Kakarot's sentiment that this Majin Buu sideshow may at least be worth a temporary look. But Vegeta, ever stubborn, decided that if they were going to do it, it was going to be his way, and knocked his unsuspecting Saiyan rival out cold, confiscating the remaining bushes baked he carried in his fanny pack and made his way to Ground Zero determined to atone for his sins, Solo. Back at Boo's birthday party, with Deborah out of the way, things began to heat up. Swallowing what was left of his pride, Gohan grabbed Supremely Scared and attempted to fly away from the scene of the crime, but to no avail and was quickly one-shotted out of relevancy, leaving Supreme Kai to face his sleep paralysis demon alone. Bruh, on the rewatch, can I just tell y'all how low-key anxiety-provoking and scary movie-esque this part of the story is? In approximately two scenes, Boo had everyone look into his eyes and confirm that he was the captain now. Supreme Lord Dump has established since the very moment he was introduced just how hellish of a creature Boo is and the way Toriyama as well as the animators on the TV version use body language and exaggerated expressions on Kai's part to sell his fear and desperation do so much to make this scene of a 700-pound bubblegum man dancing before he puts you through a wall way more nightmarish than it has any right to be. And y'all know how much I love some Supreme Kai slander, but I gotta give dude props here. As scared as he was of this fella, and as much as he knew the treatment he was about to receive, Buddy did his best to stand on business and fight back. Getting in his Jean Grey bag and trying to use key and telekinesis to win some of his personal space back, and creating enough time for Gohan's overshields to recharge and get back in the fight, no John Halo. Even after getting discombobulated and hammer fisted, the purple messiah stood up once again, ten toes down against Boo, invoking his emperor's hockey and the vain hope that utilizing techniques from other anime might give him the faintest shot against the Majin Alpha Supreme. This only made things worse, however. Much like his other pink cousin from a different multiverse, Boo absorbed the technique and sent it flying back at supremely sorry 100 fold, launching the dude a good 50 feet. And one thing I didn't peep until watching the show again on this go around is how the TV team did what they like to do and really drew the hell out of this ass whooping bro don't get me wrong kai got his ass beat in the manga too but the tv airing gives us damn near a whole episode of supreme kai getting melted complete with bobby in the background hitting the cotton eye joe for every tooth kai loses and gohan sitting in the rocks for a good 20 minutes just watching the whole thing like damn this dude's really getting his ass beat well, how long the beating goes on for in the animated version, it actually ends up making Gohan look even more sorry than he should, because as an audience member, you're sitting there watching like, really bro, you got hammer fisted one time by this Majin Buu fella, and now you out here paralyzed for a half hour? Even your boy Kai stood up faster than you and Buu's been playing Gaga Ball with Buddy's head this whole episode. After knocking Kai around some more, Boo decides that he wants to try out a move he saw playing video games in his Pokeball for the last few years, and hits a quick Bowser down smash, putting his full body weight on Supreme Kai's spinal cord, making him regret deciding to ever come to this planet in the first place. Honestly y'all, watching this whole thing play out really does get me wondering just what the hell was this dude's plan in the first place. I understand him coming to the world tournament and playing 4D chess to figure out where Bobby was in order to figure out where the resurrection was going to take place, but once he did, just what was Buddy's plan. Homie's reconnaissance was clearly trash because one, he had no idea just what type of time these earth dudes were on, so he was gambling bringing them in as allies from the jump. Two, but he had no idea Bobby had linked up with Deborah, whom clearly had Kai pressed and doubting whether he had what it takes to run dude's fate or not. For all that smugness, this man did not show up to Earth with any type of viable plan at all for real. Just a mohawk and vibes gassed up off the fact that he's Kyle Sheen and nobody in Universe 7 really got hands like that besides Boo for real and he's still incubating so now he was going to get in his bag. Now look at him, mohawk in disarray with a 900 pound demi fiend crushing his pelvis while a naked mole rat emotes in front of him all because he didn't want to do prep work. Always do your homework people, don't end up like Supreme Kai. Thankfully for him, Gohan finally took a couple good swigs of his inhaler and was able to get a little breathing room, hitting Boo with a dynamic entry to avoid the involuntary snoo snoo session. Gohan was sad too, man put his whole body weight behind that kick only for Boo to tumble out of it with a 9 star gymnastics floor routine like nothing happened. Boo decided that he's seen enough of this dude Gohan for a little bit and made up his mind. 
hitting him with the see you again at the halfway point of the arc beam, sending Gohan into the stratosphere, looking like a brand new contestant at that hole in the wall game show before Kai luckily had mercy and exploded the beam in midair before his MacGuffin got sent into the sun. As Gohan landed in the jungle for his arc long nap to think about what he's become, Kai was still back in the wasteland floor dealing with deep leg thrombosis, praying for a shonen miracle to come save him from another thwomping. Rufus gave the order to snuff out Kai, to which Boo responded that he's hungry, so he'd actually prefer to just eat him to take care of things. Bruh, I was dying because even Bobby had to look at him like, bro, what did you say? And before he could begin unpacking that last statement, a spear from off screen came in and pierced Hannibal directly through his midsection. Deborah, of all people, had risen from third string villain purgatory in order to claim his rightful place back from Majin Buu. While this is happening, good old Golten and Trunks arrive on the scene to start staking things out, trying to piece together what's going on as they observe the purple dude from the tournament with his legs turned to jello while Satan just threw a spear through a sentient piece of Bubblegum's ribcage. And speaking of piecing things together, the boys just so happen to land right next to the statues of Krillin and Big Green, when Trunks admiring the magnificent craftsmanship pushes a little bit too hard and explodes the homie into no less than 7,000 pieces as Goten looks on in terror. The first time I watched this, I was in shambles. No pun intended. I really could not believe that Madman Toriyama just nuked one of my favorite characters out of existence off the back of a four panel gag. As much as it broke my heart though, it's completely on brand because Kami knows Toriyama is not afraid to hurt your feelings and completely end or subvert entire storylines at the drop of a hat. Rest in peace to the GOAT, nobody out here like him. After watching Trunks catch his first body at the age of 8, our view returns to the nondescript Wasteland 3 where Deborah was attempting to inform his previous master of the folly of recruiting Majin Buu. Letting him know a creature that large and frontal lobes that smooth could only serve as a liability. Attempting to control him was as useless as trying to find a flaw in his goatee. Master, you must rid yourself of this pink abomination this instant. Who will you call upon to solve your Sudokus when they become particularly puzzled? Who else shall massage your shoulders with a firm but delicate caress? Sir, please silence Dabura. Your position has been usurped. I asked you to take your place in the third string rogues gallery with a shred of dignity. I thought this driveling below you. While Tim and Rufus continued their pillow talk, Boo began to regenerate and came to the conclusion that he would save Kyle Sheen for later. His new dinner option just so lovingly presented itself. And y'all remember how I was speaking on getting deleted out of the main storyline off the back of a gag? I know Deborah wishes he hadn't. Because as he proceeded to square up, this man Boo proceeded to shoot a beam out of his antenna, microwaves him, and transforms this fella into a grown man-sized cookie. Not only that, big body Boo then opens up his cavernous mouth and downs this dude in one bite, no puffy. Took this fella out for some Majin eats. And over on the sidelines, Goten and Trunks got their first exposure to post-traumatic stress disorder, watching Tim Curry get killed cannibalize in front of their prepubescent eyes. During all this commotion, who else but Big Krill should emerge from his rock prison dazed and confused. While he tries to get his bearings, Goten and Trunks tell them that they found Buddy just chilling out in the desert, rock solid as they were making their way to the ridiculously high key signatures nearby. That's when Krill had a brain blast, remembering the loogie that was responsible for breaking him up, helping the boys realize that Deborah getting eaten out must have been what brought Krill back. Then a cold shiver makes its way all the way up Trunks' spine as he recalls a few moments back when he shattered what he thought was just a painstakingly detailed statue of Big Green. As he floated his way up the cliff, all we see is a shot of Piccolo's paper bag 16s and all the color and life leaving Trunks' face as he heads down below to tell the rest of his team that if they wish to keep their innocence, never go up top to look at what he just saw or speak of it ever again. I always thought it was the androids turning his future into Gotham that made future homie Trunks the way he was, but it might have actually been this moment seeing Big Green doing his best fist as a North Star henchman impersonation that was his real canon event and transformed his personality. The moment the warning left his lips to the crew though, Big Green's buttery smooth baritone inquiring about an extremely large key could be heard from the cliffside above. None was more curious than this man Trunks, who refused to accept that the mess he just saw a few moments ago could somehow have amalgamated into a functioning creature. Then Green just writes this off like, yeah, as long as my brain's intact, I can keep regenerating. Nah, buddy, you don't get to write this off like this is something you've been doing all these years. I'm getting on you. Dude watch Cell regenerate from his nucleus and says, shit, baby bro can do it. Ain't no reason Big Green can't. For years, we've been watching this man bring back damaged limbs or donut holes in his chest at best. And every time he did it, it had this man in the infirmary on low battery, hand on his CPAP, talking about how much regenerating that limb took out. 
out of him. Now you're going to sit here and tell me that this man somehow is not able to get that full body Gears of War Hammer of Dawn treatment, hit a revive, and be walking around talking like it's no issue because his medulla oblongata remain pristine. Nah, you can miss me with that piccolo. These dudes just love making up powers when it's convenient. I'm going to need the Z Warriors to relax and decide what's real and what ain't because they ain't keeping me up late at night gaslighting me like this trying to figure out what type of time they're on. Returning to current matters though, as Piccolo immediately starts bugging as he peeps Kyle Sheen in a wheelchair about to get taken back to a spawn point after the boys fill him in on what they already saw and how they watch Majin Buu turn a grown man into sweets and eat him up from the top down on some absolutely insane work. Krillin peeped how pressed Piccolo was getting and was like, look Big Green, I know you've been on Purple Dude's meat since you met him at the tournament, but with all due respect, if there's one thing I know at this point is when somebody ain't that guy. And hate to break it to you Piccolo, but you in fact are not. All you get mad right now could do is give away our position and get some of us turned into Godivas. And if it's all the same to you, some of us have a baddie to get home to and can't run the risk of getting eaten out right here. Just as it appeared Kai would be on the receiving end of a curtain call, no marshal, a large explosion went off nearby, leaving Bobby's ship in more pieces than Big Green was up on the cliff. And out of the smoke, who else should emerge but the dusty boot wearing widow's peak having man of the hour, Lord Vegeta. Determined to test the metal of this Majin Buu everyone had been in his ear about to see if he was actually worth the headaches he'd been experiencing for the last few hours. Like any kid would, Trunk started geeking when he saw his pops merge from the smoke, finally looking like the main character. In his head, the situation was already wrapped up once he saw all four feet nine inches of his pops arrive on the screen, forehead in the sun, straight glistening. Vegeta, fresh off the hive, knocking Goku out cold, came into the scene already in his bag with the oven preheated to talk absolutely reckless. So you're Majin Buu. Azura truly has been the worst seven years imaginable. Even the quality of the rogues gallery has hit the toilet bowl. Kakarot's full son truly let himself get bested by a morbidly obese piece of big league chew. Honestly, the saddest fall of an entire bloodline I've witnessed since the Jacksons. Boo looked at his master, wondering what the dirty man with the big head just said, and Bobby was all too happy to get him up to speed on the road session, which had Boo quickly putting the prints on his list and ensuring his date with an easy bake oven would be coming much sooner than later. As Piccolo worked to process Vegeta's words regarding Gohan, and everyone in attendance began to quake in fear at the magnitude of Boo's key charge, Vegeta just stood his ground with a smirk, because he knew what was coming. As Boo stanced up and began drawing closer, Kai, who was still enjoying his all-mud buffet, was the only one to hear the words, Sorry, Fatso, but I assure you I won't be going to hell alone. Both you and that rat are going with me. Kai couldn't believe it. This man, Vegeta, really came to the scene to commit the biggest crash out of his life, and he didn't have the energy to help or even just ask the guy to do it farther away so he didn't become collateral. And for a minute, things were looking pretty nice for the Prince of All Climaxes. He was really getting his racks off against Boo. Every hit sounded like a truck making contact with a concrete wall as he released upon Boo every bit of anger and frustration he'd been holding on to since Goku Boo balled him earlier. Piccolo and the rest looked on, admiring the frankly worrisome level of strength Vegeta was putting out against Boo, with Big Green remarking on how at this point he was fighting at a threshold far above a Super Saiyan. It was more like what they saw Gohan do against Cell all those years back. And if he wants to be even more real, it might be even past that. As much as he hated to admit it, frankly, Vegeta had been possessed by the spirit of that dog, and all they could do was admire how far the man had come. Vegeta, having enough of getting his hands dirty, gathered his energy and shot a beam of concentrated power that had everyone, including Boo, worried what would happen if the thing connected. In short fashion, Vegeta fired and sent a pipe and hot one straight through Boo's midsection and for a moment, nothing but tumbleweeds and the overwhelming sound of silence filled the battlefield. But this did not last long, cause damn near as quickly as he dropped, was Boo back up again, with the hole that previously populated his protruding pelvis now sealed in perfect order as if it never happened. Even worse for everyone in attendance though, was the fact that not only was Boo at full health, but now he was pissed. And without warning, the cotton candy colored cretin was determined to make cadavers out of the remaining audience, building his power to unhealthy healthy levels with little warning as the Z homies as well as Bobby did their best to brace for impact, which occurred in spectacularly explosive fashion and was quite a bit worse than any present were realistically ready for. After the flash subsided, the Z homies began a head count for those in attendance, with all being accounted for except the two major players, Kyo and Vegeta. Kyle Sheen continued to remain AWOL, but eventually the prince emerged from the rubble. But consequences were grim, as Piccolo observed Vegeta holding on to that bad 3-point arm 18 gave him all those years ago, which let him know this fight was about to be over. And here, with Kyle Sheen unaccounted for and Vegeta in need of a charger, is where we'll call it. The horror movie that is Majin Buu has just begun, homies, and I could not be more excited for it. Tune in next time as Vegeta continues to stand his ground against the manifestation of evil Majin Buu. 
Will our unlikely hero be able to turn things around as Earth's last remaining hope? Or has the time for miracles passed as the Earth prepares for the crowning of its new pink tinted emperor? Only one way to find out. Be easy, y'all, and I'll catch you again in the next episode.